Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. <laughs> Welcome to Insights in the Entertainment. This is episode uh, 131, Getting Weird with Adele and the Gang. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my festive and generous co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, dear? I'm doing wonderful. And you? I'm doing well. So we took a week off last week for the holiday. Mm -hmm. We are back this week. We'll get a couple podcasts in before the next holiday, probably. Maybe. We'll see. We're probably going to be taking, I'm guessing, the week of Christmas off, and the week after that we'll be taking off as well. Uh, yeah, probably. No no modifications, major modifications at the studio this time, though. Because <laughs> not like we really made them the one time we, no. we said we were going to. We, we changed like two things. That's true. That <laughs> we, true. we did make a modification. Just I was very ambitious, one. but and, lacked energy. So right. Yeah. Well, it's okay. Decided to enjoy the time off. Absolutely. Um, oh, also we'll be recording the Christmas special this weekend, hopefully. So that mm -hmm. should be out in time for the holiday. Mm -hmm. Yep. Before we do get into it though, I did have one programming note. I dropped it on our insights in the teens. I wanted to mention mm -hmm. it here as well. When we are broadcasting, whether it's live now during the week in the evenings or during the week, we do rebroadcasts of our podcasts. Um, we do it through a reflector service called Restream.io, and what that allows us to do is stream out to, I think right now we're doing five different stream providers out there. They all provide their own chat service. Unfortunately, I don't have the ability to monitor all of those chat services. Uh, so as a result, there are people who do attempt to interact with us while we're broadcasting that I don't always see because I generally just monitor the Twitch chat stream. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I wanted to apologize for anybody who was trying to interact with us but couldn't because I don't monitor five chat streams at once. However, after the first of the year, we probably will be putting our own Discord server in place that will allow us to have one centralized location that we can monitor all of our um, show chats and stuff like that and let people interact with us. And it's just another another method that folks can interact with us. So I hope to have that in probably the first couple of weeks of January and we can uh, avoid this problem in the future. But anyway, my apologies if you feel that we've been neglecting you through some of the chat chats on the stream. It obviously services. wasn't on purpose. No, it was not. <clears throat> so today in our Disney detective for the first time ever, black Santas are appearing at Disney parks plus an alternate Cinderella castle suite. that guests can actually book. Then in our tales from the edge of the galaxy, a live action Sabine Wren has been cast for star Wars Ahsoka and a recent Book of Boba TV special reveals new footage of the much-anticipated show. And for our entertainment news, Adele gets an emotional surprise during her UK TV special. And Weird Al is distancing himself from a new Kid Rock parody style video. And then we'll, always, we'll obviously finish up with our insightful picks and some afterthoughts. Uh, ready to get into it? Sure. All right, let's get going. Go for Disney Detective. So Disney parks in California and Florida have quietly included Black Santas throughout their theme parks for the first time in the company's 66-year theme park history. 
According to CNN, visitors and staff at Disneyland Resorts in Anaheim and the Walt Disney World Resort in Lake Buena Vista, Florida, have spotted Black Santas at certain meet-and-greet events and at after-hour Christmas parties. Santa Claus is represented in various ways in local and regional communities around the world, which is what inspired Disneyland Resort and Walt Disney World to reflect the diversity of its surrounding communities, according to a Disney spokesperson who spoke with CNN. The company didn't officially announce it would be including Black Santas in its Christmas celebrations this year. The move by Disney made some fans emotional, with Victoria Wade, who is a theme park social media influencer who happens to be black, tweeting, Never in my life did I think Disney would actually put a black Santa in the parks. With Disney implementing this change as part of their diversity and inclusion initiative, it really allows me to feel more comfortable and seen when I visit the parks. Ultimately, it makes me feel more accepted, welcome, and I'm thrilled at what this will do for children of all backgrounds when they visit Disney parks. Wade wasn't the only one applauding Disney's diversity uh, efforts. Multiple users on Twitter also appreciated the presence of Black Santas. One said, I'm pretty sure I caught my very first Black... I." caught the very first Black Santa to ever be at Walt Disney World, and I'm seriously crying happy tears. Now, Disney isn't the first company to expand its diversity and inclusion efforts. Cookie company Oreo uh, released a holiday commercial featuring a Black Santa, and clothing retailer Old Navy is getting involved with the company's launch of Santa Boot Camp, which is a program designated to encourage diverse groups of people to play the iconic Christmas character. You know, it seems almost strange that it took Disney this long to do yeah. it, given their other diversity movements that they've had. Right. And they've always been, I know, in Epcot because of all the different countries, uh, you know, that they have represented there. I know they've always had holiday themes based off of those different countries. So, um, you know, different types of Santas or Santas dressed in different right, outfits right. and, you know, and, and the thing with it. But yeah, it is kind of surprising when you think about all these other places that have been doing it already and that Disney was finally like, you know what, maybe we should do yeah. this too. Yeah. It's nice to see that they're, they're being more inclusive. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's surprising that it took this long. Right, right. But yeah, good for Disney for that. Absolutely. Good for Disney for making another dream come true, too. Tell us about that one. <laughs> one that we will never get to experience. <laughs> um, so if you have ever wanted to stay in the Cinderella Castle Suite at Walt Disney World Resort, now there's kind of a way that you can stay in the same level of luxury, detail, and magic. But unfortunately, guests are not able to book the Cinderella Castle Suite at the Magic Kingdom, no matter how big your wallet is. So for those of you that don't know, there is a special suite inside of Cinderella's castle that Walt had originally intended to be used for his family. Of course, we all know that Walt sadly did not live to see the Magic Kingdom open, but eventually the space was turned into a suite as it was always intended for the Year of a Million Dreams promotion that they had a couple of years ago. So during this event, guests were chosen to win a night in the jaw-dropping Cinderella Castle suite and stay at Magic Kingdom overnight. Now the suite is typically used as a charity incentive prize or given out at random. And because of the level of detail, such as fireworks going through the fireplace, stars lighting up, the Grecian god-looking tub, and more, guests have always dreamed of staying there. But you can actually spend $12,000 to take a tour, which will include seeing the suite. However, staying in it, as we've mentioned, is not an option unless you're somebody like Katy Perry. But during last week's Destination D23 um, 
presentation that they did during the Disney Wish segment, we got to learn more about the Castle on the Sea, which will be making her maiden voyage in summer 2022. In this, Disney highlighted the Wish Tower Suite, which is themed to Moana. It was said that the suite is like the Cinderella Castle Suite, but on water. And to make a statement such as this is quite grand, considering the converted nature of the Cinderella Castle Suite and paints the Wish Tower to have the very high bar to be met. But if Disney is looking at the room as an equal to the Cinderella Castle Suite, it will undoubtedly be something to dream about. The room will have Moana accents to it, as well as two master bedrooms, a kid's bedroom with built-in bunk beds, and a library that can be transformed into another bedroom if needed, as does the Cinderella Castle suite, as well as access to a personal concierge team and more. Now, according to the Disney Parks blog announcement, they said, see the, see the line where the sea meets the, where the sky meets the sea. Tongue twister right there. It's calling guests home to the Wish Tower Suite, a first-of-its-kind accommodation set high in the forward funnel of the Disney Wish, our newest ship, which is sailing summer of 2022. This 1,966-square-foot penthouse in the sky will be our most unique Disney Cruise Line accommodation yet, and it's the crown jewel of a truly jaw-dropping array of staterooms and suites aboard the Disney Wish. Every storybook-inspired stateroom on this ship will be a luxurious, peaceful retreat designed with ample rooms for families, plenty of storage, and upscaled amenities. So, if you want to experience this, you're gonna have to pay. What we found out was that the price for this particular sailing is just over $21,000 for two adults. Pricing, of course, goes up with additional guests. And the two story Disney Princess Suite is similarly priced for a four-night stay in July, running at almost $28,000 for two adults. So... We're not doing that. <laughs> Like, someone has to kind of explain to me why Disney seems to have this move of these ultra-expensive stays. So first you have the Galactic Star Cruiser. Right. Now you have these thirty thousand dollar cruises. Mm -hmm. Like, does Disney really not care about the average home, right. the average family anymore? Right. Are they only catering to to the exceedingly rich people that don't have kids? Because you know it's right. It's just thirty. Like, you know, twenty eight thousand dollars just for two adults. You don't and, get anybody else in there. And who do we blame for this? Bob number two. Bob number two. <laughs> right. I didn't like Bob number one. But at least Bob number one didn't deliberately go out of his way right. to alienate every right. other customer out there. Right. Right. Exactly. You know. So, and it's so funny because the rest of the article, you know, goes, oh, and there's all these other activities. Well, yeah, for $29,000. <laughs> like, <laughs> there better be a lot of other activities. Like, that's a new on. car. Yeah. That's a new car right yeah. there. It's it's ridiculous. Uh, shame on Disney for yeah for even offering something mm -hmm. like that. Shame yeah. on them. I know. If anything, create something like that and give it away for free randomly to people. Right. Exactly. Don't even make it available for people to book. Give it away for free. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Have it as a drawing or something like like that for your vacation club people. Mm -hmm. Or you just don't blatantly like promote it. <laughs> right. Like, like because they're, obviously they're so we proud know of how right. expensive these things are as right. though they're trying to be some upscale right. resort all of a sudden. And that's the thing is because you know that they already had some sort of presidential suite or, you know, and it was always one of those things that, you know, the average Joe didn't know yeah. about. And did, you know, because all of their other rooms or other resorts were reasonably priced and were you know, were yeah. very nice. And obviously, if you were ultra rich, you knew about these other things. Yeah, but like now if, to if come you out. Had the money, you could stay at the concierge level and get that kind of thing. But they didn't advertise that. Right. Because they didn't it need to. It wasn't a to. badge of honor for right. them. Where now it's like, hey, you know, they had this whole event where, 
you know, it was like the majority of the people there probably, you know, maybe there were a couple of people in that event that could have right. a- afforded it, you know. But you know what? I'm sorry. <laughs> but... For $30,000, I should get the whole damn ship to myself. <laughs> I shouldn't just get a room. Right. I don't want to borrow a room. <laughs> yeah. That. W- what's the going rate of like renting out a a private yacht right. for exactly you know, for that amount of money? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's idiotic. Idiotic. Shame on Disney. Mm-hmm. They need to they need to learn the error of their ways and get back to to where they need to be because I guarantee you, Walt Disney would be rolling over in his grave mm-hmm. with this stuff. Oh, absolutely. I agree. They're, they're shameful in what they're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that's it for our Bash Disney section. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy and Bash Star Wars a little bit, maybe. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, World Boss Hunts, Star Wars Trivia, Guild Lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So, the character of Sabine Wren has been cast for Star Wars Ahsoka. Deadline.com tells us that Natasha Lou Berdizzo has been cast as a lead opposite Rosario Dawson in the Disney Plus series Star Wars Ahsoka, a spinoff from the stream's, uh, streamer's hit series The Mandalorian. Berdizzo, Berdizzo will be taking on the character of Sabine Wren from the Star Wars Rebels animated series. Dawson stars as Ahsoka Tano in the series after making the character's live-action debut in The Mandalorian. The offshoot, executive produced by Filoni and John, uh, Dave Filoni and John Favreau, will continue Ahsoka's story. No additional information about the new series has been released by Lucasfilm, but there's been a lot of online speculation that key characters from Rebels, such as Sabine Wren, obviously, and Ezra Bridger, would join Ahsoka in the new show. This is because prior to dropping in on The Mandalorian to assess the child, Ahsoka was last seen in the series finale of Rebels, where she and Wren set out to find Bridger, who had been whisked away by the Pergil. Sabine Wren, who was voiced on Rebels by Tia Sarkar, is a young Mandalorian warrior, graffiti artist, an Imperial Academy dropout, and a former bounty hunter, with expert knowledge of weapons and explosives. Ahsoka, which is eyeing a March production start date, is also expected to feature an appearance by Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker, who would reunite with his Jedi Padawan Ahsoka, likely in flashbacks as the series is set five years after Return of the Jedi. So this is kind of cool that they're bringing Mm -hmm. more characters from the animated series back in. Yeah. Uh, They did a fantastic job with Ahsoka. That episode with Ahsoka was was just incredible. Mm -hmm. The, The... choreography of the fight, yeah. the cinematics of it. Um, but Sabine Wren was one of the favorites that came out of mm-hmm. Rebels. Right. And the character itself, she was one of the few characters, well, they all went through a lot of character development, but she went through numerous phases in what was really a fairly short series. Um, and she came in kind of as, as this, you know, late teenager kid. Right. And you really got to see her mature a lot through the entire series itself Mm -hmm. up until the finale there. Um, So the fact that they're bringing her back in for this, I think is great. She's definitely, she's going to be another uh, great fan favorite for cosplayers too, because people were already doing I was going to say they were already dressing as her to begin with. So So I'm curious. She had a very 
customized, unique look. Mm -hmm. You know, she wears Mandalorian armor, but being a graffiti artist, it was heavily customized. Mm -hmm. So I'm very curious to see how well they bring that look back with her into live action. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we also have uh, the Book of Boba, the Book of Boba Fett TV uh, spot revealed. We had a special that we had uh, uh, had an opportunity to watch. That revealed a lot of interesting new information on the new TV uh, series. So comicbook.com tells us that Disney and Lucasfilm recently released the new television spot for the Book of Boba Fett, which offered a first look at new footage from the upcoming Disney Plus series, which releases the end of this month. Um, it really, the, its release follows the first official trailer and a previous promotional video for the show, which spins out The Mandalorian's second season. The Book of Boba Fett stars Tamora Morrison as Boba Fett and Ming-Na Wen as Fennec Shan as they attempt to fill the power vacuum in the Star Wars Galaxy Underworld left by the death of Jabba the Hutt in Return of the Jedi. According to the show's synopsis, the Book of Boba Fett finds legendary bounty hunter Boba Fett and mercenary Fennec Shan navigating the galaxy's underworld when they return to the sands of Tatooine to stake their claim on the territory once ruled by Jabba the Hutt and his crime syndicate. In an interview from June, Wen explains how the Mandalorian and the Boba Fett and the Book of Boba Fett differ. She says probably there will be some similarities. Tonally, you'll know Mandalorian is very much a loner except for his relationship with Grogu. So just the dynamic that there is now with a team between Boba Fett and Fennec Shan, I think that really creates a different quality for the show. Yeah, that's about all I can say, which is, you know, typical for most of our Star Wars shows. Robert Rodriguez directed Boba Fett's return in Chapter 14, The Tragedy, of the Mandalorian, he's teased that the Book of Boba Fett will feature even more epic action with the iconic bounty hunter. In a recent interview, Rodriguez says, I've got so much to tell you about that, but I'm out of time. Yeah, I can't say anything about that. Sworn to silence. I can't say I'm, I can say I'm working on it and I can tell you it's going to blow your mind. You'll, you saw him arrive in my episode of the Mandalorian. That was nothing. I can talk it up all I want because I know it's going to deliver. I know it's going to over deliver. So we'll see. The Book of Boba Fett is one of several Star Wars shows headed to Disney+. Plus. The Mandalorian is filming its third season. Ahsoka will begin filming soon. And Obi-Wan Kenobi wrapped filming in September. So what do you think of the, uh, of the special? I liked it. It definitely gave you... Um, you know, some perspective on it. And like we had even, you know, talked about, you know, previously before is that Boba Fett was just this, you know, background character, yeah. but yet he had such a presence that everybody watching had picked up on and you had people started, you know, dressing up like him and making their own costumes when there was nothing out there. So there was this like fascination with it. And he was probably that one character, you know, where you always, you know, you always say, oh, we don't need a backstory on this guy. We don't need the, you know, but with Boba Fett and especially when you had the the original trilogy, the the prequel trilogies come out and you kind of saw how Boba Fett became Boba Fett. It was kind of interesting, you know, and of course, obviously, you know. Everybody thought Boba Fett was dead. Right. <laughs> that right. was kind of, you know, to su so with a Mandalorian, you know, giving you those hints at first, then it was like, all right, he's, he's kind of cool. And then when he shows up and goes through everything, you're like, all right, he, he's yeah. badass. You know, this yeah, the, is kind of the, the cool. The special wasn't really what I thought it was going to be. It was less behind the scenes stuff and mm. it was kind of more historical. Yeah, yeah. kind of driving the story of Boba Fett mm -hmm. more than it was behind the scenes and uh, concept art and stuff like right, that. So right. it wasn't what I was expecting, but I mm -hmm. did like it. What I did like, they had a recent teaser trailer that they had released about this right. that showed some more footage from the show and it it kind of hinted at they're going to tell you the story of how he survives mm. 
the, okay. the Sarlacc pit okay. and how he got to where he got to and how he lost his armor and, you know, stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Um, so it, it definitely looks interesting. Uh, hopefully it lives up to the hype though. Well, and so far we haven't been disappointed with anything that Filoni and Favreau have done right. with with Star Wars. They, you they know, can if do anything no wrong they've you know, if anything they've helped to save, you know, because obviously we both agree that the recent movies, you know, besides Rogue One really yeah. have kind of been lacking i'm glad i've turned to the dark side <laughs> well with a shirt like that how can i not <laughs> <laughs> so that was all we had for our tales from the edge of the galaxy we'll be right back after this quick break with our entertainment news of the week Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. So if you've been living under a rock, you haven't heard anything from Adele <laughs> in, in a while. She's she's in the news almost every day uh, between um, the various TV specials, her, uh, her album obviously coming out, cat scratching and stuff for... No, that wasn't the cat scratching. It sounded like a cat scratching. You never know. It Miranda. certainly wasn't Adele. She was okay, she wasn't, she wasn't knocking Go. I'm here! So Adele is known for moving fans to tears with her music, but the Grammy Award winning singer shed some of her own after a surprise reunion with a former high school teacher. The emotional moment happened during the British Powerhouse's ITV concert special, An Audience with Adele, which aired in the UK the other week. During the pre-recorded concert, the pop superstar took a question from Hollywood actress Emma Thompson, who asked whether there was anybody in her past who had supported her, inspired her, or protected her from life's trials and tribulations. In response, Adele opened, about, opened up about the impact Miss McDonald, her English teacher at Chestnut Grove Academy had on her. The London-born singer shared, I had a teacher at Chestnut Grove who taught me English. That was Miss McDonald. She got me really into English literature. Like, I've always been obsessed with English, and obviously now I write lyrics. She was so bloody cool, so engaging, Adele added, recalling that M McDonald often wore sequins and gold bracelets. She really made us care, and we knew that she cared about us. Thompson then revealed that McDonald, whom Adele hadn't seen in 20 years, was in the audience. It was the t it was time for the singer, who is used to surprising fans at her concerts, to be left stunned. In the clip, which 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 was shared on ITV's Twitter account from the highly anticipated televised UK concert special, Adele embraced her former mentor after she was brought on stage. I'm so proud of you, McDonald had said to Adele, crying tears of joy. During their exchange, the hitmaker told McDonald, you really did change my life. Now I've got to go get my whole face redone, the 33-year-old star joked after wiping tears away. So then she called on host Alan Carr to step in and entertain the audience with a song while she stepped away to get her composure and get her her face redone. It's really a, a funny clip. Um 
After the special aired, Adele took to Twitter to share her excitement at the reunion. Home sweet home, I've always dreamt of doing an audience with, she wrote alongside a series of pictures from the TV special, adding, There was such love in the room for each other. It felt like such a gig. And my teacher, Miss McDonald, was there. It was just, it was just like heaven. An audience with Adele was filmed at the London Palladium earlier this month in front of a star-studded audience, which included the likes of Samuel L. Jackson, Jodie Comer, and Idris Elba. The broadcast comes a week behind a similar U.S. TV special, Adele, One Night Only, which was included with an emotional interview with Oprah Winfrey. She's obviously currently promoting her new album, 30, which is her fourth studio album and the first to be released since her last album in 2015. And the project, which focuses on Adele's healing process following her divorce from her uh, ex-husband, Simon, has garnered widespread acclaim from music critics everywhere. This was a cute story. Mm -hmm. I like this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's really a class act. And the fact that she's that emotional about... A former teacher. That's from not, 20 that, years ago, from when she was 13. Right. You know? And it wasn't even like a music teacher or right, someone who inspired right. her to get into this business. It was someone that inspired her to learn the language. Right. And to learn to write. Mm-hmm. And and that really is the key to her music is the way right. that she can write mm-hmm. these lyrics. Right. And, and the effect that she has on other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's her teacher coming through. Absolutely. I think that's really neat. The only thing that I am a little, you know, miffed about is we, there were two events. We didn't get invites to either of them. I know. We didn't get. (laughs) I thought we were on the list. I I thought we, I thought we were tight with her, you know, but you know, she did announce, unfortunately, it seems the only concert she's going to be doing in the U S next year is a residency in Las Vegas. Which is, You know what? If she wants to give us front row tickets for that, I'd be happy to show up for her. If she wants to send out a private private plane plane for us, we're totally okay with that. Yes. I do not fly domestic anymore. (laughs) With the pandemic. So I'll be happy to show up. We'll we'll even do the podcast from the show. Okay. You know, I think that we could, we could put that out to her, right? We could, we could do the interviewer right there. You know, I think we do pretty good interviews. <gasps> oh, my God. Could you imagine? That would be kind of cool that for us, cool. you know, to go out there and, and mm-hmm. do a team yeah. interview of her. I think yeah. that would be awesome. That would be awesome. Uh, but, it, you know, if she can't do that, she's – I'd be more than happy to – We can to, Zoom. I'd be more than happy to Zoom – and, and do an interview. So Adele, I know you watch the podcast. Um, drop us a line comments at insights into things.com. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> and if that wasn't weird, <laughs> oh. let's really get weird. That was a good one. <laughs> So, um, so it seems that Weird Al kind of shades Kid Rock, which is a beautiful thing. So Weird Al Yankovic wants everyone to know that he had nothing to do with Kid Rock's latest ranty video. Yankovic had tweeted, to everybody that's congratulating me on the new Kid Rock parody video, let me clarify, that's not me. That's actually Kid Rock. Kid Rock's new uh, song and video, Don't Tell Me How to Live, is an attack on snowflakes. But the extensive list of complaints makes Kid Rock look like a snowflake himself as he rages on against millennials. Talking all this BS he whines into the camera um, near the start of the song. He also flies around straddling a giant finger while firing a gun in a song and video that is closely resembled a parody that many commenters mockingly congratulated Yankovic. Oh, you really nailed it, Weird Al. Finally, a new Weird Al video, another person wrote. And then finally, fans of Weird Al started uh, commenting back saying, Weird Al just eviscerated King Rock like a surgeon. Somebody else said, Weird Al is slamming Kid Rock harder than The Rock was slamming Vince McMahon. (laughs) And somebody else said, that's it. Nothing will be funnier than this. Kid Rock discourse has peaked. Weird Al, you're an absolute legend. Somebody else said, oh my God, I just watched it and I'm really like, is this a Weird Al parody of Kid Rock song? He talks about offending millennials, even though that means 
ad- adults under 40 now. Who is this guy? Does anybody know who he is or even looks like? He looks like Zach Galifianakis. <laughs> And of course, somebody else says, Weird Al never misses, goat. Another person had said this was the tweet of the year candidate. And Al, please accept that this internet, you won fair and square and your crown is ready, sir. Um, I actually tried watching the video and I couldn't even make it like a minute in. I was so disgusted by it. But, yeah, I could definitely see how people thought it it wasn't a real video, that it it was a a, a fake video and figured, okay, maybe it was <laughs> it was weird Al. So now what is Weird Al's response? So Weird Al now has to do a parody of oh, this parody. Oh, now. I'm sure. I'm sure he's going to do something. Now, I did actually see him tweet something today about concert information for next year, so – Again, weird out. We're, you know, we'll promote you on the show. Come on in. We'll- You're, you know, we'd love to do an interview. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll Zoom. We'll come out to you. Uh, but if you're in the area and you got a concert there, throw some tickets our way. We'll give them out to the audience. You know, we'll, we'll right. get people right in. We'll do a contest and do a ticket there you giveaway. Go. There you go. <laughs> anyway. Hey, you know what? You never know. There might be somebody listening that is friends or works for or something. You never know. <laughs> if nothing else, we get to have fun with it. Absolutely. That's what we're here for. So I think that was all we had for our entertainment news this week. Yep. We'll be right back with your insightful pick. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick is The Beatles' Get Back, which has been playing on Disney+. Plus. The Beatles' Get Back is a 2021 documentary series directed and produced by Peter Jackson, and it covers the making of The Beatles' 1970 album, Let It Be, which had been the working title of Get Back and draws from a material originally captured for Michael Lindsay Hogg's 1970 documentary of the album. Originally conceived as a feature film, The Beatles Get Back consists of three episodes with runtimes between two and three hours, resulting in a total runtime of nearly eight hours of material. The series is presented by Walt Disney Studios in association with Apple Corp and Wingnut Films. Jackson characterized The Beatles' Get Back as a documentary about a documentary. Commentators have described it as a challenging longtime belief that the making of Let It Be was marked entirely by tensions between the Beatles, showing a more upbeat side of the production. It premiered on Disney Plus consecutively on the 25th through the 27th of November, and the miniseries was widely acclaimed by critics who highlighted the historical merit of the footage and its showing of the inner workings of the band, although some deemed the runtime to be excessive. So, being a Beatles fan, and this was a very interesting kind of fly on the wall take of things Um, because you got to see the inner workings of the band and kind of the end of the band, you know, at the time they didn't know it was the end of them. Um, There are kind of hints throughout, you know, that there's some tension. Um, You know, one of the things that, you know, many years later, even in various interviews, you know, oh, Yoko was the one that broke up the group or whatever. And you see this and Yoko is being very supportive. Yoko is just kind of sitting in the background. Of course, there's also some Hare Krishna sitting in the background, too, which is a little odd at one point. Um, but like you don't see anything. If anything, she's being supportive and and being, you know, just there to, to take all this in. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting is just to see the process of how a song started as one way and totally morphed into something else. So, like, you sit there and you watch it and you hear them strumming along and you start singing the words that you know the song is, but they don't know it yet. They haven't done it yet. And a lot of times with a lot of songs, they came up with 
the melody first. So, and then they just kind of throw in words or names of people. And what was kind of interesting was they would like throw up little, uh, comments about oh this person was a famous um uh british boxer or this person was somebody else because you're you're sitting there going who is that what you know what what is that and they kind of go into the history of how that song kind of came to be and it was funny i was uh listening to preston and steve and they were talking about it too and how they're sitting there and he's singing a song and he's singing the wrong lines and like you almost want to yell at the tv no that's not the words it's this (laughs) because everybody knows the the words to the song but they didn't know it yet so it's kind of interesting to see that aspect of it and then you get to see where george kind of like gave up really at at one point and at the end of the one episode he's like during lunch he's like all right see you guys later i guess you're gonna replace me and he just walks off like there's no big fight there's no nothing but you can tell there had been all this tension kind of leading up to it um so you can kind of tell that it's the beginning of the end and the way that it starts off is that they're filming all this stuff they're gonna make a movie but they're also planning that this is only going to be like a two or three week thing to do a live television show at the end. And then all the plans just kind of change in the middle. And it's like, well, let's not do this. Let's do something else. But we're not sure. But we know we have to be finished by this certain day because Ringo has a project that he's going to. So like they knew they had certain timelines But it's like, well, what are we doing today? And, you know, George left and it was like, well, we're not going to do anything today. We'll just come back tomorrow, you know? And it's like, okay. So again, it was very interesting because everybody knows how it ended. Everybody knows where, you know, it is today. But to just see that process, it is kind of long. It's definitely one of those things where you just kind of maybe watch it as background noise in some respects, but there are things that, cause it's not your typical documentary where you have the commentator talking about and today on the, da, da. so sometimes you do actually have to look at the screen and read, you know what they say, but it's definitely one of those things that you don't have to be like completely glued to watch it. I know you only watched a little bit of the the first episode. So, it would be nice if they kind of came out with like a condensed <laughs> version for those that want to watch it. Definitely the third episode is, you know, probably the the best one, you know, of them all. Okay. Good pick. Thank you. So, my pick this week, not a documentary, surprisingly enough, My pick this week is Star Trek Discovery. I have been binge watching Star Trek Discovery since we got Paramount Plus. Uh, I had refused to get it before. We got it for something else, and I figured, all right, this is my chance to watch it. So I've I've burned through season one, through season two, and now I'm on season three. So the series begins roughly ten years before the events of Star Trek, the original series. That's Commander Michael Burnham. Rec, um, Commander, Commander Michael Burnham's recklessness starts a war between the United Federation of Planets and the Klingon Empire. She's court-martialed, demoted, and sentenced to prison, but through a series of unusual events, winds up assigned to the starship Discovery. Discovery has a unique, secret means of propulsion known as the spore drive, And after an adventure in the Mirror Universe, the crew of Discovery helps to end the Klingon War, and Burnham is restored to the rank of Commander. That's Season 1. So in Season 2, the Discovery crew investigates seven mysterious signals and a strange figure known as the Red Angel, and they also fight off some rogue artificial intelligence or something. And in the third season, Burnham and the crew of the Discovery find the Federation fragmented and investigate the cause of a cataclysmic event known as the Burn. Now, that's very high-level descriptions of those three (laughs) seasons, missing a lot of details, so go watch it. It was very good. Uh, The first season uh, was probably the best so far. The first season was, was interesting for a number of reasons. It was loaded with action from the first episode... 
um, and throughout the whole season and kept you on the edge of your seat, which is not your typical Star Trek experience when it comes to series television. There is a well-placed series of leads that point to a major plot twist later in the season, which was very well done. Like They had planned the whole thing out very well, and it was a progression to get to that point, which was nicely done. You also get to see a side of Klingons that you never saw before. Klingons are a race that's been thoroughly covered in the series uh, of the franchise through other epi- uh, other series versions of the show. You also get guest appearances by a famous ship, which shall remain unnamed in this um, pick, and a famous, though little-seen captain in franchise history, which makes for very interesting tie into the original series on multiple occasions. Creatively, the first season was brilliant. Filmed in the very familiar lens flare-filled style of J.J. Abrams, the entire season had a theatrical flair you don't normally see in series television. The uh, concept of following a lesser array of characters offers um, a rather than, I'm sorry, The concept of following a lesser array of officers rather than the swashbuckling or genius diplomat senior officers was a refreshing take on the franchise that demonstrates there's more to Star Trek than just the captains. Character development was a little slow and somewhat forced, but by season three, there's a familiarity and emotional investment in most of the characters, despite the repetitive character flaws that act as plot points. The second season was a little bit slower and sloppier, as if they kind of had an ultimate point in mind that they wanted to get to, and then they kind of muddled their way along to get there. It lacked the same polish as season one, but was still enjoyable. The cavalcade of characters marching in and out of the storyline helps to keep the dialogue and the plot fresh from episode to episode, rather than the same fixed group of people in every show. Season three, which I'm, I think, four or five episodes into at this point in time, looks promising. But again, it's one that seems to have a fixed endpoint, and they're trying to reach the same meandering way to get to the end of the season that they did in season two, rather than the strategically planned progression of season one, with all the hooks laid out nice and neat. Season four is releasing now, and for our... Viewers in the well, outside of the United States, it's difficult for you to watch it at this point in time because of the change from CBS All Access to Paramount Plus and licensing and then pulling it off of Netflix and all other kinds of stuff. I haven't watched any of season four yet. I want to get through season three. Then I'll promptly move on to four where I'm looking forward to seeing where the story goes. So that's my pick this week. Star Trek Discovery on Paramount Plus. And we'll be right back. So, that was it for the meat and potatoes of the show today. Dear, mm-hmm. what did we have for our afterthoughts? So, for our latkes and jelly donuts. <laughs> that was funny. That was good. So, uh, two events that are coming up both next weekend already, uh, if we can believe it. Uh, we we have, can, because I have Friday off to go to one of them. Yeah, exactly. Hey, so do I. Uh, so, we have the Ocean City Comic Con, which is Saturday, uh, December 11th from 10 to 5 at the Roland E. Powell Convention Center in Ocean City, Maryland. Um, if you are not going to that, but in the Allentown, Pennsylvania area, there is the Pennsylvania Toy and Comic Super Show, which is also Saturday, December 11th from 10 to 2 p.m. Um, and then we're starting to get information for shows for next year because this is pretty much the end of the comic shows uh, for this year. But we have... Conveniently fi- enough, it's also... The end end of of the the year. year. Wow. It's funny how that happens. Um, So this was one that kind of was going back and forth with the dates and because this was actually originally supposed to happen at the end of uh, November. And I guess something happened with the dates. But now they officially have dates for Fan Expo, which is 
uh, the new name of what Wizard World became. Um, and right now it is planned for the Philadelphia Convention Center in Center City because the one date that we had was going to be in Oaks, Pennsylvania. So now they are... So it's are... not going to be a greater convention now. No. It's not the greater Philly... No, it's at the Philadelphia Expo Center and it will be the weekend of April 8th through the 10th. And obviously we'll have more information as it gets a little closer. All right. I think that was it for today. Before we go, I do want to encourage our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can get um, audio versions of the podcast listed as insights into entertainment. Video versions of the podcast can be found listed as insights into things. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Any place you can get a podcast. I would also encourage you to uh, write into us, give us your feedback, give us your shows so we can highlight them in our afterthoughts. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. On Facebook, we're at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things. Or you can get links to everything and more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com. And that's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.